Okay, it's uh, 3.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. I see that the, the room is still um, filling up. Just absolutely thrilled that so many people have registered and are attending today. Really pleased to have you all here um, to uh, discuss with us this topic. Um, my name is Jill Jacobs. I am the Commissioner of the Administration um, on Disabilities at the Administration for Community Living. Um, we worked really hard to put this together uh, for you all. Um, I'm just going to uh, give a description of myself for those who um, cannot see me. I am mm, a woman with uh, white, pale white skin. I have uh, brown hair. It's about shoulder length. I'm wearing a, a top that's white with some pastel colors on it, and I have an American flag and I think that's an HHS flag behind me. I keep meaning to check and I always forget. <laughs> so um, I am in my office um, in Washington, DC. So that's what I look like. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, again, I'm Jill Jacobs. I'm the commissioner at the Administration on Disabilities. Um, so let's talk a little bit. I'm just gonna introduce today a little bit our program. Um, what, what we're gonna do, we'll start out with me speaking, and then we'll have opening remarks from our federal partners. Um, then we'll do an introduction um, to the topic of intellectual and developmental disabilities and uh, sexual assault, how those two things um, are, are come together in some way. Um, and then we'll do a panel discussion um, with survivors. Um, we will have an opportunity then for questions and answers from all of you and for discussion. Um, and um, this, uh, if you stay the whole time, you'll have an opportunity um, to get continuing education units, CEUs. 1.5 CEUs will be offered um, for attending this, this webinar today. Um, so um, a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, just so you may have heard that uh, 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 someone saying this webinar is being recorded, it's being recorded right now. So you're all aware of that. Um, if you have questions, please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. You'll see it down there at the bottom. I think it's about one, two, three, four icons over from the left. There's a little thing that says Q&A. If you put questions in the chat, we might miss them. So please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, and again, you have to attend the full webinar to get your um, CEUs. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about uh, your well-being. Um, this is a topic that is important that we discuss. Uh, talking about sexual violence is, is um, maybe difficult. Um, and uh, talking about sexual violence as it uh, relates to people with disabilities and survivors, you know, um, that can be a challenge to share. It can be a challenge to um, hear and see and witness stories. Um, so we want to make sure that you're okay. Um, you know, this is a trigger warning. There can be triggering stories in here. So we want to make sure you're going to be okay, that we're all okay. Um, so during the webinar, you know, if you need to step away, look away, um, turn down your volume, if you need to stop altogether, that's okay. We understand that. Um, and we want to, you to make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Um, so if, if you have any kind of difficulty with this information, you take care of you, okay? Um, we also are gonna be dropping um, links in, uh, to the national hotlines in case you need to talk with someone as a result of this webinar. There, the screen is up there now that shows those links. Um, that's the RAIN Sexual Assault and National Domestic Violence Hotline Chat. So please um, use those um, if you feel like you need to. And of course, you can always share those too with anybody else. So um, that's really all I'm going to be doing today. Just a little intro of what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. And um, I will I will kick it off with our federal partners by turning it over to um, our colleague from the White House, Kaylin Crockett. Kaylin. Hi, everyone. I'm trying to figure out how to enable my video, but I don't think it's really working. Great. Fantastic. Hi everyone, my name is Kaylin Crockett and I am a senior advisor with the White House Gender Policy Council and dual-hatted uh, as a director in the National Security Council. 
I am absolutely uh, humbled and honored to be with you here today for this incredibly important discussion on supporting survivors of sexual violence with disabilities. In many ways, I think this webinar is uh, it's long overdue, frankly. Uh, we know, uh, and as the speakers with lived experience and expertise uh, and advocates uh, that you will hear from in this conversation will share, people with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by violence and abuse across the life force. And in particular, uh, what's incredibly troubling about this disproportionate impact in experience of gender-based violence and sexual-based sexual violence is that all too often, access to services for healing, justice, and support are inaccessible. Uh, whether you are a survivor with an intellectual disability or a physical disability uh, or a combination of multiple disabilities, uh, all too often uh, we see that survivors uh, cannot uh, seek uh, the justice and healing that they need um, because there's a lack of cultural competence uh, and support um, in the field of victim services, despite the fact that for decades, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, really requires uh, that to be the case. Um, the president uh, is a lifelong uh, advocate for survivors uh, from every background uh, and survivors with disabilities uh, in particular, uh, having championed and written the first Violence Against Women Act in 1994, which every time has been reauthorized, has been strengthened to be more inclusive uh, and to support more groups of survivors. Uh, and we're incredibly proud that the Violence Against Women Act has had been um, for several iterations, uh, dedicated and um, specialized programming for survivors with disabilities. Uh, but we also know that across the administration and through the Department of Health and Human Services uh, and the work of the Administration for Community Living, there are uh, additional uh, centers of excellence uh, that are supporting um, coordination with uh, community-based victim services uh, and improving research on how we can better support survivors with disabilities. I uh, want to just quickly uh, close uh, by saying two things. One is that uh, at the end of last month, the administration issued the first ever national plan to end gender-based violence. And this plan is a whole of government approach that for the first time offers a roadmap to guide and importantly coordinate federal departments and agencies in the work that they can do to better support survivors and prevent and address all forms of gender-based violence throughout the life course. This national plan importantly takes an intersectional, inclusive, and life course approach to uh, addressing the risk and protective factors of gender-based violence that importantly recognizes the disproportionate impact and experiences of different communities. But in doing so, it also looks to be survivor-centered and trauma-informed and recognizing really the strength and the resilience of different communities of survivors, uh, in particular survivors with disabilities. Uh, there is, of course, an incredibly, as other speakers will speak about uh, in this discussion, we live in a very ableist society. Uh, and uh, part of the myopia of that ableism is seeing survivors with disabilities through the lens only of victimhood. And we know that survivors with disabilities are so much more than the violence and excuse, abuse that they experience. And so what's so important about this discussion today and the leaders and experts that you will soon hear from is that there is a way to channel that strength and that resilience and have that inform better policy. And that is the purpose of our discussion today. It's to raise awareness, it's to in reinforce the dedication of this administration to inclusive and intersectional approaches to preventing and addressing gender-based violence. And it's really to honor and to center the communities that are directly impacted because we know in particular with the leadership and the self-advocacy of the disability community, nothing about us without us is absolutely paramount. And it should be the same when it comes to gender-based violence prevention and response. 
that um, that will will do it for me. Uh, I want to really just maximize the time for the experts on this call. But on behalf of the White House Gender Policy Council and the administration, I want to just thank you uh, for your dedication, your leadership, and your resilience. Uh, and it's so exciting to see. I think we have almost a thousand people tuned into this webinar, um, which just goes to show uh, how much of a demand signal there is rightly. Uh, for attention to this community um, that has been overlooked and underserved for far too long. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kaylin. I am Kara Ayers. There's my video. Um, and I'm happy to join you all today. Um, I'm also moved by the um, attendees and also the active chat of how many people are joining us from across the country about this, um, to talk about this important topic. So I'm going to provide a brief introduction. Um, I, I wear a few hats, like I'm sure many of us do, but um, Today, I am going to um, talk from my position um, as an individual with a disability, but also I'm the director of the National Center for Disability Equity and Intersectionality. So um, next slide, I'm going to provide a, a little bit of an overview, but first I think it's important to know um, who I am. So I am um, a white woman who's wearing glasses and has shoulder length brown hair, um, and I'm wearing a, a dress with a floral pattern. I'm in my office today. Um, if I were with you in person, you would see that I'm also a wheelchair user, and you'd also see my service dog with me. Um, I am a professor and researcher. I'm trained as a psychologist. Um, I'm also a disabled woman and a parent to children with and without disabilities. And the kind of approach of this webinar that I'm most excited about is when you'll be able to hear from our survivors, um, their stories, and um, I've already had the chance to learn from them. And, um, and I integrate stories like that into the research that I do, because I think these are stories are some of the most powerful vehicles that we have for change, both at an individual level, but also at a system level. So um, I'm excited for you to hear from them in just a little bit. Next slide. Before we, um, as we get started today, I wanted to do some level setting with our language. I know that language is powerful. Um, it shapes the way that we think, our attitudes that we have, and it shapes the way that we behave. Um, we have different, in this group, I'm sure we have many different approaches to language about disability. So some of us might use person first language, like saying I'm a person with a disability. Um, some of us might prefer identity first language. You heard me personally um, introduce myself as a disabled woman. I tend to bounce back and forth. Um, but there's also language differences in the ways that we talk about sexual assault. So some people um, may use words like sexual assault victims. Um, some may prefer words like survivor. Um, so I just want us to be aware that language is varied. They, um, these are all valid ways to talk about this difficult topic. And we likely have many reasons um, about why we choose the words to use and why we, we don't use others. Um, I think one thing that we share in common maybe across our different approaches is using some variation of the word disability. So either disability or disabled to be clear that what we're talking about is a really important issue faced by our community, sexual assault of our community members. Um, and making sure that it's clear that while this isn't an issue that is unique to the disability community, our community faces additional barriers um, to getting the help that we need and to getting a response um, from law enforcement. So that's what we're going to be talking a bit more about today. Next slide. You've heard a few um, statistics from Kaylin, and I wanted to provide all of those kind of in one place. Um, so people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are more than seven times likely to experience sexual assault than people without disabilities. And when we look specifically at women with disabilities, um, that rate increases to 12 times as likely. So women with disabilities are 12 times more likely to be sexual assault, sexually assaulted in their lifetime compared to women without disabilities. Another unfortunate reality when we look over the research is that abuse is often repeated and chronic. So um, more often than not, these are not one-time occurrences. They are happening more than once and they're happening over a long extended period of time. Um, 
So you can think about the aspect of trauma that relates to that type of abuse and the way that it is carried out. Also, unfortunately, um, abuse is often committed by paid service providers, and it often occurs in disability service settings. And I, I saw people in the chat sharing their survivor experiences um, briefly during their introductions. And so, again, this is um, something that is somewhat unique to our community and something that we need to talk about. And not only today, but something that we also need to think about when we talk about home and community-based services and the importance of getting our community members out of institutions and into communities um, with safe providers that they can choose. So hopefully you can see where I see how many um, disability issues this overlaps with. Um, few of these crimes are reported according to the research and there's lots of reasons for that. Um, and charges and conviction of perpetrators are rare. So unfortunately, um, people are not held accountable in the system. They may be repeat offenders. And, um, and I mentioned that there are reasons for why crimes aren't reported. And so let's go to the next slide to look at one of those reasons. Um, so ableism worsens the problem of sexual assault of people with disabilities. And I really see this as an emergency within our community. Um, and I think, you know, given today's attendance, many of you do, you do as well. Next slide. So when I um, think about ableism and teach different groups and different ages about ableism, I often use this image on this slide and it's a black and white image of a factory smokestack. And so you can see like a big plume of smog coming out of the um, smokestack. And so I talk about this because we don't always know that we're breathing in ableism. It's in messages that we're taught. It's in images that we do or we don't see of the way people with disabilities are represented or not represented in the media. Um, and so we get these ideas and I, I'm intentionally saying we because people with disabilities take in these ideas too. Um, and so we have these ideas that often devalue um, disabled lives or teach us that a disabled life is less worth living. Um, and so it can be covert, meaning hidden. If we maybe lived a couple miles from this factory, we might not be able to see the smog in the air, but we would still be breathing it in, which would be really unhealthy and, and harmful. So that's why I have on this slide, ableism can be covert, but it is still poisonous. Next slide. And so these are some more specific ways that ableism contributes to this problem. So there are stereotypes about people with disabilities, like the idea that we are not sexual beings. And these are dangerous stereotypes because many people with disabilities who try to report an assault are not believed because they are not thought of as engaging in any type of sexual activity. Um, and there's all sorts of other stereotypes about people with disabilities, what we may or may not be able to understand or what we may or may not want or prefer in a relationship that can really become dangerous um, when we talk about the risk of sexual assault. Um, another example of how ableism contributes to this problem is that many people with disabilities are denied sexual education. So when we're not taught about our bodies or taught about what to expect or boundaries of our body or what consent means, how we are allowed to say no. And this gets even more complicated when you have a disability um, because many of us have gone to doctors and as kids had medical procedures that um, we may or may not have consented and said was okay to. So um, control over your body as a person with a disability is um, related to ableism and something that is um, a challenge to this issue. But from one point we can start at is making sure that all children and adolescents with disabilities and adults um, can continue to have access to comprehensive sexual education. Our third example here is that fear, isolation, and uncertain, uncertainty can combine to make telling somebody about a sexual assault more difficult or maybe even dangerous if a person is um, fearful of retaliation. So when we think of that reality that many people are assaulted in their homes where they live by paid staff. Um, so just the fear of reporting that and feeling so alone is a part of this issue that we must address. And then another example, not the last example, but the last I'm going to share with you today um, is that many times people with disabilities may have had a negative history with law enforcement. Um, and so they may be hesitant to report because of that. And even if they get over that hurdle, and report, they may find that the interview process of how they report 
um, what happened to them can be inaccessible. So there may not be supports to work with someone who has difficulty speaking or um, needs questions worded in some different ways, um, or they may be handed a pamphlet with lots of words, but no support in reading or understanding what all of that information needs. So there are definitely connections to ableism with this topic and ways that we can address that. Next slide. So it's my hope that as you listen today, you'll think of ways that we can improve communication access. You'll think of the importance of um, developing and promoting accessible and safe alternatives to abusive people and settings. And you'll listen to the stories that you're, you'll hear today with an open heart and an open mind about how you can learn from their bravery and apply what you've learned to um, decrease sexual assaults and also support people who have experienced them to tell their stories to get justice. Next slide. And so last, these are just a few ways that you can contact me after today if you'd like to, I am welcome to that. And um, yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna pass it to Lynn next, thanks. Hi everybody, let's go to the next slide. I'm Lynn Rosenthal and I'm the HHS Director of Sexual and Gender-Based Violence and I am within the Office of the Assistant Secretary to, for Health, but I work across this big agency to address sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, for those of you who want to know what I look like, I have, I'm wearing blue glasses, I have short brown curly hair, I'm a white woman, and I'm wearing a flowered blue and green shirt. And I've got a background that has the HHS symbol on it. Uh, I want to thank Kaylin Crockett and Kara, Kara for that fantastic overview, and Kaylin Crockett for really showing us the commitment of this administration to addressing sexual violence against everyone and against people with disabilities as well. Uh, the heart of today's conversation is the views experiences and expertise of our survivor panelists. And let's go to the next slide. I'm going to introduce our moderator, Nancy Smith, and then I'll tell you just a little bit about our three panelists, but they will really tell you more about themselves. Nancy Smith is the moderator of our panel. She is the director of Activating Change. This is an organization that works to end victimization, incarceration, and institutionalization of people with disabilities and deaf people. Nancy, someone I've known uh, for a long time, and she has devoted many years to developing equitable, accessible, and coordinated services for survivors. Thank you so much for being here, Nancy. I wanna briefly introduce our panelists and then I'll turn it over to Nancy to continue to moderate this panel. And as I said, you'll hear more from our panelists. They'll tell you more about themselves. What I can tell you is I'm just absolutely honored to have met them and had a chance to speak with them. So let me tell you about our three great speakers today. Cindy Bentley is the executive director of People First in Wisconsin. Cindy has won many awards and honors for her work and is considered one of Wisconsin's most inspirational leaders and activists. Keisha Weller is a longtime abuse prevention advocate. She has held many leadership positions at the local, state, and national level and is a passionate advocate for people with disabilities. And James Meadows is a well-known advocate and public speaker. He is the advocacy and outreach lead at Strategic Educational Solutions and a tireless advocate for the voices and rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Just before I turn it over to Nancy, I wanted to say one uh, very poignant announcement, and that is that we're dedicating this program today to a woman named Leslie Meyer, who some of you may know or work with, Leslie passed away unexpectedly last week, and she was a key part of the Activating Change team and a dear friend of our panelists here today. And you'll hear more about her as we go through this panel as well. So let me now turn it over to Nancy Smith to begin our panel. Thank you, 
Thank you so much, Lynn. And I'd like to invite our panelists, um, Cindy, Keisha, and James to join me. Um, I really want to um, thank everyone for the opportunity to be here. It is an honor to moderate um, this panel. As Lynn mentioned, my name is Nancy Smith and I am the executive director of Activating Change. I am a white uh, gender non-conforming white woman with brown hair and uh, in a mohawk and I'm wearing a black blazer and a black shirt. There is a white wall uh, next to me and behind me with some photos of my pets and a cabinet and shelves with decorative items. As Lynn mentioned, uh, Activating Change is a national nonprofit. Our work focuses on ending the widespread victimization and mass incarceration of people with disabilities and deaf people. And we support people with disabilities and victim service providers, uh, disability advocates, criminal justice personnel, and others to disrupt violence in the lives of people with disabilities. Um, to remove barriers to services that are rooted in ableism, autism, and racism, and to create pathways for safety and healing for survivors with disabilities and deaf people. And there is a growing movement in this country um, to end violence against people with disabilities. And that movement is really powered by people. People like today's panelists, Cindy, Keisha, and James, who you'll meet in a minute, and all of you who have joined this webinar and have a critical role to play in ending violence in the lives of people with disabilities. As Lynn mentioned, um, this past week has been hard for many of us in this movement. Um, we lost a fierce advocate, Leslie Myers. Uh, Leslie was a beloved member of the Activating Change team and a longtime advocate for people with disabilities who experienced abuse. And we'd like to take a moment of silence to recognize our lost colleague, Leslie Myers, who was an important force in all of our lives and mostly, but mostly Cindy's. Thank you, everyone. And Cindy, Keisha, and James, thank you all for being here. I know it is not easy for any of you to talk about what has happened to you, but hearing your stories is so important. And I want to thank you. And I know that everyone on this webinar is grateful for you being here today. Just as a reminder, um, we have a couple questions that we're gonna use to guide our conversation today. And the first question that I have, um, I actually want to ask you, Keisha, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, my, um, my name is Keisha Weller. I am, just a minute, I've got some technical issues. Have to, sorry about that. That's okay, okay take your that's time, much Keisha. better. My, my name is Keisha Weller, and I am an abuse prevention awareness activist. I specialize in prevention of sexual violence against people with disabilities. I got started in my abuse prevention work in 2012 when I was on the California State Council on Developmental Disabilities. The Board Resource Center Abuse Prevention and self advocacy Advisory Team started to investigate abuse in the developmental center in California, which is a state hospital. I knew as a sexual assault survivor that through my lived experience, I could help others who had suffered from sexual violence in their own lives. 
I have an extremely strong passion for sexual violence prevention work. In addition to my sexual violence work, I have been a disability justice activist for more than 30 years. I have, I have done most of my disability justice work in the state of California. However, I do on occasion have done my justice disability justice work nationally as well. My specialization is working on people with intellectual Deven developmental Disabilities, or IDD for short. We are so happy to have you here today, Keisha. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, Cindy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I am an African-American woman with an intellectual disability. And I'm the, I'm the executive director of People First of Wisconsin. Glad to be here. Also, People First is a statewide advocacy group. We work on a lot of advocacy issues, including voting, housing, transportation, employment, and sexually violence position. It is very, it is very important for people to know that they're their options and what their um, resources are. There are currently, there is a currently shortage of um, caregivers and job coaches and that res resources, um, they don't help with, let me see, sorry. I'm kind of nervous because, um, it's, it is important for people to know their options and what their resources are. There is currently a sh shortage of caregivers, job coaches, and that doesn't help with the path to independence. I think it is important for people with second disabilities to be free, be able to make their own choices. We do not believe in segregation where 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 and and who they live with or what they or where they work. And what they do is their own choice. I grew up in a state institution. I have been free place for 29 years. I am living my best life now. Next year, I will celebrate 40 years free and plan to have a big party and an event, an event on advocacy for community living. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cindy. We are so You're glad welcome. you were here. And if Thank we're you. all honest, we're all a pr pretty nervous, I'm sure, um, because we have a big audience, but we are here mm -hmm. together supporting each other. And we are going to do an amazing job. Um, so we all can take a deep breath yeah, um, I'm, just to yeah, help I'm, us kind of yeah, shake off right. those nerves. <laughs> it's, and it's because a lot, you know, I want to do, I'm sorry if you're crying, but it's really... Um, because I, Leslie, I know she's listening to us up in heaven, but it's just really hard. I mean, it didn't hit me until I started to to do this right now, but just forgive me. Um, it's hard, but I'm going to do this because she would like us to do this. So thank you so much. Yeah, Cindy. Thank well, you. Leslie was an yeah. amazing person and she is here with yeah. us. Um, her spirit is here. So we could all take another deep breath um, just to ground ourselves um, in this moment. And we're here for each other. Thank um, you. James, we would yeah. love um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, um, before that, I want to share something very personal. It is very humble in the site at the same time. 
to have so many people in this room because a long time ago, we didn't have a lot of people talk about this issue. And I feel very overwhelmed in a good way and excited because we come a long way from few people to adults. Yeah, one adults, one down. So again, 1,111 people in this room because we come a long way from that. Because that's important because before we don't have a lot of people to talk about it. But I'm James Smithers. I am from San Antonio, Texas. I am the advocacy and outreach lead for strategic, I always have a ton of time with this word, strategic education solutions. I'm a social assault survivor and national no advocate. And also I just got appointed to the, the member of the president's committee for people with and into disabilities. Share what, sorry, share what you want to, start with kids. Share what you want to say about your, with your sexual assault experience. I look at lightning strike three times in my life and I was heard as a young person by a p people in my high school. I never told anyone I did not think I would be believed. The second time I was sexual saw that the husband of a authority figure, I was afraid I would get in trouble. I never thought that I would be hurt again in 2004. This time, I decided to press charges. What well, do I want? Okay. Stop. Then we take in turn. Sorry. I'm going to stop there. Are you sure, James? Yeah, I'm sure. Because I wanted okay. to break down each question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, James, I want to um, appreciate so much you, and I'm, I'm grateful for you just starting to share some of your story with us. I know that it is not easy, and we will have more time um, during our time together to learn more from your experiences. Um, and I also want to thank you, James, um, for naming um, the progress that we have made in the work that we have been doing together, because I, too, remember... Um, some of us together have been in rooms where maybe we only had five people um, in the audience. And it is incredible for us to just take a moment um, to celebrate um, how far we have come and at the same time acknowledge that we um, have farther to go. And we've gotten to where we are today really thanks to um, the advocacy of each of you. And um, you're an amazing um, and powerful uh, panel. And I'm just so um, sort of honored to be here and be um, a part of this discussion. Um, and, um, you know, again, you know, everyone here wants to learn from your experiences. And I think we know that we can do better. We do have more to do. Um, and we acknowledge that these stories, like you just shared, James, they are hard for us to hear. Um, they are hard for you to share, um, but they are so powerful. And um, I'm wondering, Keisha, if you want um, to share with us more about your experience. Oh, definitely. I am. Um, I am. Um, I just. I just want to say, first of all, before I tell everybody my Me Too story, how honored I am to be speaking to such a large crowd of people, because it, it's um, it's very, it's very important work that um, all three, all, all three of us are doing, in 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 HHS is doing as well. So I am. I will now tell you my Me Too story. People, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are more prone to being taken advantage of and being victims of sexual abuse. 
a few years ago with the National Arts, National Center for Criminal Justice and Disability, I published my Me, Me Too story. It all began at a sub advocacy meeting. There's, that's where I met Michael, a other self-advocate. We had a lot in common, like playing chess. Like, one day, one day after my self meeting, I invited him back to my apartment to play chess with me. And um, I was, and as soon as he entered my house, he started to kiss me. He dragged me towards the couch, pushed me down, and he raped me. I was confused and horrified that he had raped me. Michael betrayed my trust in him. I was bruised. My body hurt from the rape. After he left, I reported the rape to the police. The woman police officer told me that they would have to call Michael and interview him and get back to me about pressing charges against Michael. I was later told that the case was closed because our stories were not the same about what happened. Michael claimed that the sex between us was consensual. It was not consensual. I was not believed. I was told, how, do, how, how could he do it? He's so nice. I was shaken after the decision by law enforcement. I didn't know where to turn. I called my case manager at the District Justice Center. She listened and filled out the required special incident report. But she did not give me any supportive solutions, such as telling me to go to a doctor to get examined, or where to reach out for counseling. I waited for a follow-up call about what to do next, but she never called. Even though I did not get a call back, I pursued Holly Hurst since I did not know what else to do. I never received a copy of the report of the report, and I didn't know if my case manager even reported my rape to APS, even though she's a man day reporter. I never received a visit from a social worker. The system in place to help me actually failed me greatly. For several years, I sank into a deep depression. I couldn't get motivated to truly live because of all the emotional scarring that occurred from the freaking rape. Feeling shame about what had happened to me and nowhere to turn, I finally opened up to a service provider and the service provider got me the support I desperately needed. As a grown adult, I should be able to get the support I needed from the system that was set up to support people with disabilities. I am healthy today because I was referred to an excellent inpatient program with specialized therapy and structured follow-up that continues today. Additionally, I made the decision to use my lived experience as an opportunity to engage in advocacy work and educate others about the issue of sexual violence against people with disabilities and with people with intellectual disabilities in order of depth. I use my various leadership roles to bring together different agencies to develop solutions to this very problem. However, my story is not unique. People with disabilities experience abuse and sexual assault at many times higher rate than those without disabilities. My, James, my friend, James Madures, will talk more about this, but men 
with disabilities are also at risk. Keisha, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and also um, for casting a spotlight on how sometimes law enforcement and advocates can be dismissive of sexual assault against people with disabilities. And I'm really sorry that that happened to you. Um, James, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share a little bit more about your, your experience um, and to talk a little bit more about the way that men with disabilities are also at risk. Sure. Do you want me to read the whole speech or break it down each segment? Um, you could break it down, um, maybe starting okay, with your because, experience. Okay, because I don't want to take over the other two presentations. This is why I pause and let other people speak. I need to know that someone would believe me, especially, especially a third figure, because when I was a child, not a child, but a teenager, I didn't find a third figure from the public school because at the time I wasn't at my neighborhood school. I went to a school across town because the education system wasn't, wasn't really willing to support me because no one gave my mom and father the tools they need to keep me in my neighborhood school. As a sexual assault survivor from my last assault, I was grateful for the 211 system get the services I needed. But I was afraid of APS, Adult Protective Services, because I felt they would not believe me. I went to the hospital. There I met my senior nurse. The senior nurse full initials are the sexual assault nurse examiner. And she was terrific and she took one step at a time. She listened my needs. Recently, I found her on Facebook and reconnect her. She is a part of my advisor team I'm on now. After I left the hospital, I consulted a consulting, I got counseling, but the, they did not know how to help a male survivor. And it's the next person. Oh, I'm sorry. It, it's almost 20 years since my last assault. What helps me now to work on projects and to help prevent sexual assaults of others with intellectual disabilities. Now I'm stopping. Thank you, James. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, Cindy, I wanna check in with you. I, I know that we would um, be grateful about to hear from your you in terms of your story. I wanted to check in and make sure um, that you're doing okay. Um, I know that it is hard to tell um, so I just wanted to check in to see if you're still okay t telling your story. I'm brave, and I'm going to persevere through this, and I'm going to do this. Thank you. Okay. I'll be all right. So whenever you want me to start now, okay. Yep, so go ahead, Cindy. I am a, I am a, I, oops, sorry. I am a, oh, shoot, Cindy. I am, oh, here we go. I am a victim of sexy assault from a young age living in, in, in a state institution. I was young, too young to understand what was happening at the time. I had, I, time I had a good memory and that's what probably had the good memory helps and gave, gave me, I gave, details about what happened when I was leaving the institution at age 26. I told them what happened to me and I was able to get justice and and he went to prison. So I had 26 years 
before I could get justice. Mm -hmm. And since then, the person has died. Not that I wanted this person to die. It still doesn't bring a lot of closure because I was so young in the first place. So that's what, that's what happened. So um, I'm still suffering from this. And I think I'll be in this trauma the rest of my life. It gets better in some ways, but I think talking about it to um, professionals in that is going to help other people that are still in these group homes or institutions to um, to make sure that they're not going to happen to them because we don't still know. Every five minutes, I heard somebody's getting exactly assaulted or abused. So, okay, um, um, you got. I think you go next. I think. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Cindy, um, and really thank you uh, to James and Keisha as well for sharing your experiences. Again, I know it's not easy. Um, I would like us to talk a little bit about um, what you need service providers to know, um, you know, how they could better support um, survivors with disabilities. And, you know, Cindy, I, I know you and I um, have talked and, and you shared with me about um, what Leslie did um, to help you. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more. Uh, yeah, so me and Leslie goes way back. Um, so I met, I'm from Milwaukee, actually city Glendale, but Leslie worked at our independence, um, independence first in Milwaukee. And it was another person too, um, but she, she taught me how to talk about my story. The first time I ever really uh, talked about it and I learned about different, uh, different different kind of abuses, not only sexy assault, but also taking people to a bank, banks and taking their money, or if they don't apply, if they didn't, if they didn't um, um, do what the caregiver or somebody wanted to do, they made them stay in bed all day if they're you know, in a wheelchair. And so there's, I learned that and we always talked and uh, I did some national work with her and Keisha. I think James too, but I know I did um, some national work with Keisha and um, she had me um, doing some keynotes and talking. And so that was way back when I was just beginning to be an advocate. I, I was working at people first, but um, so I did it behind the scenes, I think, but um, Leslie is my hero because, you know, when you when you have this happened to me when I was young, little, never had you know been to help class yet in high school, so it's like she was a comfort to me, and she says, you know, and she I remember we were at a conference and she just hold me tight and she was. She said, it's going to be okay someday, maybe, she said, because I, she said, I don't know how you, you you feel, Cindy, but I love you. And that's what she used to say to me. I always say when I'm off the phone with people that I love you. And so I know, you know, and so, you know, I could have hated this person for the rest of my life, but I decided to forgive this person that did this to me, but I still have the trauma, so... There we, there we go, is um, it's this hard. And um, Leslie would want me to be brave today and do the same thing she taught me. And that's what I'm doing. So thank mm -hmm. you for, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Cindy. And I know um, just a couple things that I, I really heard you share in terms of what, you know, Leslie did is, is first off, um, believing you and um, believing um, what happened to you, which is so important and is, is just such a, a, a foundation of providing. Um, what you also shared with Leslie, you know, was very um, warm and compassionate and really took the time um, to listen to you and um, to support you. And I think that those are all really good um, pieces of advice for all of us to hold um, 
you know, as we continue with our work with people with disabilities. So thank you um, and one for other sharing thing that. I, I have one other thing to say. Yep. And I have to thank uh, Pam Malley. Uh, she, uh, in Wisconsin, she works on um, safe and free and also she helps us in, you know, the, she still helps me too to talk about my story. I had to do a few conversation things this year already. So this is well, my third one, I think. And um, so Pam Milley and Leslie are my heroes because Leslie was my hero, hero in Illinois. He was in Milwaukee, but he moved to Illinois. Wasn't that happy about it, but you know how it goes. But then we have another nice, uh, nice person, which is Pam Milley. You probably heard her. She's been all around the state and been around, uh, you know, in, I think um, like in your area too. So she's my hero too. So thank you. I just wanted to mention her too. Well, I know Pam as well. And I know that both, um, I think Pam and Leslie consider you their hero. So um, the feeling is absolutely um, mutual thank with you. both of them. Thank you so much. Um, Keisha, do you want to um, share um, about what you want service providers to know? Yes, of course. <clears throat> and I am, and I also want to say that I worked, I have worked with Leslie Meyer for a long, long time, just like um, Cindy has, and um, I am, and I'm dedicating all this work that I'm doing on this webinar right to Leslie, because I am, um, I honor her, I respect her, and I miss her. Here are, here are some basic values that are important for people with disabilities who are happen to be sexual assault survivors. Respect and dignity, treating people with disabilities with the same respect and opportunities that you offer to anyone else. To me, dignity means being treated with honor, integrity, and courtesy. Empathy and understanding. Empathy and understanding are key to humanizing people with disabilities. It involves putting yourself in their shoes and recognizing the challenges we face on a daily basis. Believe. Too many times, victims are simply not believed, like in my case. Believe when we all share our experiences with you. Language and communication. Language is a powerful tool that can either humanize or dehumanize people with disabilities. It is important to use respectful and empowering language when referring to individuals with disabilities and to communicate with them in ways that are accessible and inclusive to them. People with please provide people with disabilities who have, have experienced sexual violence, a warm handoff. Providing a warm handoff to the next provider is very important thing to do. As you heard in my own Me Too story, I didn't get a warm handoff to a provider that would have helped me start the healing process from trauma. A warm handoff is essential because survivors who don't get a warm handoff can have this disastrous outcomes in their lives. Thank you so much, Keisha. Um, I think these are all really important um, recommendations for all of us to take with us um, in our work. And I think we often forget just how many Me Too moments there have been um, for people with disabilities. Um, James, I'm wondering if you wanna share um, what you want service providers to know. Sure. Um, one of the neat opportunities I have was that that I did a video, two videos, 
now one video and one on the break two in the radio but one video is that when I did the one and six video and when we did the one and six video we did not know myself and my friend Leon Davis and when we got there was six men and at the same time um like six females were there because the six women did not know who were the survivors were. And also the men don't know who the person, who they're gonna meet. Mm -hmm. And it was great because we teach service providers about listening to the survivor stories, no matter how young or how old they were. And during the same time, we did a story about National Public Radio about abuse and betray because we do Joe Shapiro interview me. We share different stories from different people from different states. And also he was in a conference in Pennsylvania to hear what people are talking about sexual assault because it was a big need in the country. The other great thing was that when I took the job with security education solutions. In 2000, I was just a person who worked on a grant on about sexual assault. And we did toolkits for survivors and also, also people who are working with service providers to take the time to listen to us because we have it on Facebook to to hear in what survivors saying, but also talk about difficult issues, challenging issues. It was so great doing that. And after the three year experience with the grant was that I got an opportunity when Cindy, after the grant was over, almost over, she asked me if I'd be willing to be an employee. And now I'm a part-time employee to talk about sexual assault and also talk about the new project we're working on is try to include more self-advocates to be involved with, with research, no matter if it's a research project on sexual assault or a different projects, because we want self-advocates share their experience and oftentimes they get only a gift card at $25 or $50, but they get real money to earn to do the job they're doing. And also what works to be a good listener, to take the time to listen to people's stories and experience. Because sometimes it's difficult for providers to hear it because they worry about they may get in trouble Instead, they need to realize we need to hear the people who provide their services and take the time to listen to the people. And one of the, one of the things is sometimes parents put domes around our loved ones because then they play the blame game to the person who got assaulted and say, why well, you let the person comes in? And the person did not know the person would take advantage of them. If it's a male survivor or a female thing, because some of times people did not know the person was their friend, but instead they took advantage of you and caused harm onto you. And that's the most important thing is don't blame the person, not blame and said, blame the person, but help the person to recover from sexual assault. Because that's the bottom line, is to listen to survivors and not also to help provider agencies to be okay to file a complaint to, to APS, Adult Protective Service Unit, because it's very traumatic and sometimes it's scary for people. And Nancy, uh, if we have time, 
towards the end, I have one to share a quote. Okay. Um, uh, this is Nancy James. Um, we are um, probably going to open it up for um, questions in just a few minutes. So would you like to share your quote now? I'll wait until people finish ask questions then. Okay, okay. Um, well, thank you so much for um, sharing those recommendations for us. And, you know, as I uh, reflect on each of your stories and, and what you've shared, um, a few things are really sitting with me. Um, one is just how each of you um, connected with a supportive person and just how important and critical it was um, and how much that made a difference um, to each of you in your own healing and in your own journey. And at the sort of core of that, um, and, and you all sort of echoed this in, in your stories, um, was really believing and really listening um, to people with disabilities. And then also to um, really create spaces um, like this discussion um, to learn from survivors and people with disabilities and um, to create meaningful opportunities like each of you have shared um, to work alongside and work together um, with people with disabilities um, to make our victim services better um, for people with disabilities. And so I really just want to Thank all of you again um, for sharing your stories. Again, I know it is not easy, um, um, but we are learning um, from you and we have just deep gratitude for um, what you've shared and for being here with us um, today. And I know we want to open this conversation up a little oh, bit. Excuse me, um, you missed something. Yes. I was supposed yes. to be talking about the social workers still. Yeah, it's oh, on my sorry. thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. That's okay. I think we might have an opportunity to do that in some of the Q&A, if that's okay, Cindy. Um, about the social workers? Yeah, or is do you want to take a White? minute? Yeah, yeah do you want to this... take a minute and share it? Yes, you I can. do. Okay, Cindy. Yes, you can share a little bit more. It is um, on my about... thing I was supposed to do. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I, I think um, what you shared in terms of how Leslie oh. supported you um, was really yeah. important. Oh. Um, but I also would love to hear um, sort of what you want and social workers to know. What I want social workers and others to know, to believe in people, to believe, to, to believe people like me when they, when we say something happened. Don't just say, get over it. And take time and really listen to, to, to them. People with disabilities don't make up this. Don't assume every, everything, everything, and listen to what they are saying. Don't put all, all, put us all in the same category because we're all different. So um, people, I have a dis different disability than Keisha and I have a disability different one than James. So what social workers tend to do is that, you know, they sometimes put us all in one category, which is not, not right. Second of all, I get tired of, um, I hear this a lot, get over it, not only from social workers, psychologists and caregivers, some caregivers. We say something's happening, something's happening and something like this, you don't make up. And I was a child, so there is no way I can make up something like this. So um, I feel also, uh, I had social workers, I went to them I went to psychologists. No one believed what I had to say on anything I had, not only about this, but so I stopped believing in myself for a long time. And then I joined the Special Olympics and it kind of got me, got me, got me, got me talking 
in believing in myself. Now I believe that I can, you know, do a lot of things. I'm not a big fan of social workers or psychologists. Please forgive me on that. But I, I think um, that this is the 21st century and social workers that are going to college now need to really you know, really know what they're doing. Don't just go to school because you want a degree in social worker or, or in psychology. Really take your job seriously. And so that's what I believe in. And um, I just think everybody needs to be listened to. And um, I just... I just had such a bad experience with psychologists and social workers, but not that I don't, I don't hate them or anything. There just wasn't lesson. So um, the 21st century social workers, please listen, take your job seriously. Just don't come in there with a paycheck, look at your clock and you know, no. And people with disabilities take a lot of time and. Some have communication boards in there or whatever, but take your time and please listen. You know, just don't look at, like I said, don't look at your clock. Don't, this, if you're gonna be a real good social worker or a psychologist, you'll take your time. Thank you for listening. That's from the heart. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, um, Cindy. And uh, again, James, um, Cindy and Keisha, I just want to thank each of you for your courage and your commitment. Um, you shared your story in a way that I know will make a difference. And you are all so incredible. And I am so honored to know you. And I um, would like to invite um, Lynn to um, come on camera and to join us. Um, to facilitate um, just a few minutes that we have for questions. Yes, thank you, Nancy. And thank you, Cindy, Keisha, and James. Uh, it's, it's not easy to tell the stories even when you've told them before and you've done it with such a generous spirit. I know you've motivated people to get better at this work. So um, there were a number of technical questions about evidence collection and survey data. And those I'm going to uh, suggest that people reach out to Kara and Nancy um, because they're very technical questions. And um, so I wanted to talk about some of the bundled together, some of the other questions that are specific to support and care for survivors. So um, a really good question that just came in, and this is for uh, all three of our panelists is, what sort of prevention education resources would be helpful for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? What sort of prevention, what would you want to see in the way of prevention? I think sex, I know some people don't like this. I think sex education, because if we talk about sex in two ways, talk about sex and talk about when, when a person take advantage of you and when it's when the person take advantage of you tell the difference of from a person you say no to a person say yes in my opinion would be since i was uh, well that's good um for people that are older but for my age you know we don't i didn't have any i didn't know anything about sex i was only you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. So um, I think uh, make sure that you know the warning signs to a young person with a disability, check their body out, you, you know, and even a person that can't talk, you really need to be um, checking. And you know, um, what I learned from Leslie is that people it withdraw. So if a child's happy, and uh, all of a sudden, the child's not happy and not eating. Uh, need to be need need to be checked out from, you know, from the mental health part and everything. To see, you know, need to get right into some therapy or something or check the butt. You know what I mean. So I think a child is different than a teenager. Because a teenager can take sexy ed class, 
but I wasn't even old enough to take the class. I was still a child. So thank you. That was, there were a couple of questions about that very issue of consent and how do you know? Uh, so thank you for those um, answers. Actually, actually, this is Keisha. I would like some input on the question as well. Please. My, uh, my, uh, my input is that in my experience, they, um, we definitely need uh, sex education for people with disabilities early in their uh, early as as early as we can get, like um, starting starting age five, just um just um just just telling them and and educating them about boundaries, and um and um and also and also teaching them about good touch, bad touch. Um, before even before they go into school, plus um, plus in school, mo most often in special education classes, if um if if a child or teenager is in special ed in in school, I would say that um ninety percent of the time they do not get the needed sexual sexual edu education in school. Because people have this assumption, which is wrong, by the way, that people with disabilities are asexual, that we do not have sexual needs. And that, that can't be further from the truth because people with disabilities are humans. We're oh. all humans. And um, it's, it, it's, um, it's essential that so all humans, be it people with disabilities or not, get sexual education so that we know our proper boundaries. Because when, in my own case, I did get sex ed in school, and um, it was it was quite frustrating. And that starts when my first sexual assault occurred, because I didn't know proper boundaries. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you, for those answers. And there were a number of questions as well about law enforcement and what kind of training law enforcement needs to support victims, to better interview victims, and to investigate these cases. This is Cindy. I, uh, sorry. Um, I think they need a lot of training. Uh, law enforcement, you know, um, I, um, in, in, in Milwaukee, especially, I mean, I did a thing, conversation day and there was a judge on our panel and she said, you know, there's not enough evidence. They're not going to even pursue, pur pursue it. So it's kind of hard. They need you know, they need a lot of training and they need to be patient. I realize that they are trying to, you know, with the with the law, but these are people that's been sexually assaulted, like any other regular person. We are regular person. We just were have been born with a disability. But you know, those officers have a disability too, or they might have a child in their family that has a disability or a family member. And I wonder what they would do if their own child or somebody, their family get with a disability, what are they gonna do? I think not to get over it. The judges need to be better too. I mean, um, there's judges in our courthouse that shouldn't be judges because they won't prostitute, prostitute what do we call that word? It's a hard word, but you know, and it's just ridiculous. They just close the case the person scarred for life and trauma. So what's the sense of them being a judge if they're not going to abide by the law and the person go free and to see how many more people this person sacks up? So thank you for listening. Yes, yeah, thank you for the answer. And James, you were jumping in here. Sorry, James. Yeah. I didn't, sorry, James. That's okay. They don't have a hand raised thing. But for yeah, me... I find one here. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Um, for my experience, we spend tons and tons of money, have professionals do the presentations, 
to law enforcement of different situations, but barristers have advocates who present. Like for example, me and Leanne Davis from the ARC, we always try for our best to have us two together to present together when we talk about law enforcement. Because sometimes whenever I go to conferences or I see a professional that don't have no self-advocates to, how I could say, do the training with them, it's mm -hmm. very, very disturbing. Because like they all say, nothing about us without us. And I remember several years ago, when that's before the pandemic, several years ago when I went to a conference they have a guy talk about sexual assault stuff. And when I tried to meet with him, he was very, very, how I could say, disrespectful towards me because he kind of, you know how people pet your heads and stuff, but not, you cannot see it, but the way he was doing it was invisible. Oh, you're so special. Talk about this issue and stuff like that. We need to educate professionals who are making tons of money to train law enforcement to include self-advocates because that's the important thing because with self-advocates and a professional talk about, you know, the nuts and bolts of law enforcement, I think it's important to have a self-advocate present. Thank you for that answer, a self-advocate to present. Uh, there were- um, Keisha, Keisha wants to talk. Please go ahead, Keisha. Thank you, because I'm, I'm very vocal, as you know. <laughs> I am, my, uh, my, my input on that particular question is that law enforcement personnel do not know how to deal. They do not, they do not know how to work with people with disabilities because, um, because the um, like for example, in in my own case, the the officer didn't believe me. She uh, patronized me. She put me down and and told me that um, I um, she told me that um, she didn't believe me and that she assumed that I did have clarity and that um, I was incompetent to tell her my story. However. One one of the things I'm doing personally to uh, to correct that situation is um, over over the week of um, um, June nineteenth to twenty third, I'm going to be in Nevada, and I'm going to be in, in um in on um in on on uh, the twentieth and twenty second of next week. I'm going to be going to the Las Vegas and Reno Police Department, and I'm going to be speaking to them professionally about how, how they can interact with people with disabilities. I'm going to be talking with law enforcement, APS, and, um, and also prosecutors. And we're, we're going to be talking about, the, about how to humanize people with disabilities and um, and also um, how to humanize people with sexual assault victims as well, but we're also we're they, they're bringing me in. It's, it's a full panel of professionals. However, I'm the only self advocate. I'm the only person with an intellectual disability on that panel, and they're and they're putting me up on top of this oh. eight day training calendar. Because I'm going to I'm going to humanize people with disabilities to them because they don't know how to work with people with disabilities. Thank you. I think that we're gonna to have to wrap the panel there, and that's a perfect way to do it. You've told you've talked about what we need to do to help law enforcement understand this, how support workers can get better, social workers can get better. Um, what kind of prevention is needed. So Nancy, is there any last words to, to wrap up the panel? This is Nancy. I really just want to again, um, thank everyone. And I'm wondering if we could um, provide a few minutes for James to share his quote um, as a way for us to close the panel. Yeah. 
James um, is now okay. Yes, please. My favorite quote, I discovered this quote a couple of days ago. My favorite quote is from Harvey Mill. If you are not personally free to be yourself in the most most important of all human, human activities, the stress of love, then life itself loses its, its meaning. Thank you, James. Thank Very you. Very well said. I love it. Thank you. And I'm a big that's Maya a, that's Angelou. That's a great quote, James. I'm a big Thanks. Maya Angelou uh, fan too, but I love your quote. Very well said. I hope you all see there's a lot of love coming through on the on the chat. Oh yes, I've been staring it. Up. Love it. Yes, we love every support. last one of you on this that came and to listen to us today. I know I do. And and I am and I am and I'm going to piggyback on that, Cindy, because um, like like I said before, I am I am honored and pretty humbled to be in in all of your presence today, and I am um, and I am um, I respect and love every one of one of you with all my heart because you 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 got a lot from this uh, panel in this presentation and thank God for everyone. We need to thank the people that helped us get this, the, um, um, Jennifer, Lynn, you know, I know it was gonna be a hard day for us, but I remember the person that called me last Monday, I forgot, what was her name? Nancy, and she had very bad news. I was having a great Monday and then all of a sudden she called, well, called me and my heart went right to my stomach. But, and she said, you know, it's up to you to do this panel. I wasn't going to let it, let this panel not do the panel because I thought it was important, important just so you know. So thank well, you guys it, for everything. It took a lot to, with the sadness in your heart to still come and open your heart to, to be a part of this. So. Yeah. Everyone appreciates it so much. You've changed a lot of lives today, which is what each of you has been doing your whole career by telling your story. As hard as it is, you're changing lives and making things better for other people. So uh, you made a big difference today. We could see that in the chats and the comments. Um, so what I need to do, because there's been a whole bunch of questions about the, the CEUs and the certificates and so what I need to do is call up Marlo for just a minute to talk about okay. that, and then we'll come back to say goodbye to our, our panelists. Thank you, Lynn. It's okay if we could leave or we need to stay. Uh, you know what? That's a very good question. If you, if you feel like you want to leave, that's perfectly fine. You know, in fact, let's just do that. I... I just, what we have to talk about next is just how people get their certificates. <laughs> so okay. we don't need to take up everybody's time. But but I did want to say just again, another thank you as you, as you decide to leave that uh, this program has been so important. Um, everybody has learned so much and we just thank you. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. Thank you, James and, and Keisha. You guys are great advocates. I love you both. Let's stay in touch. I, am, I, love, I love you too, City and James, for great colleagues. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank, thank you all. all so much. Thank Bye, you. guys. Bye. Bye. Uh, Marlo, are, yep. you're there. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to just, for those of you asking questions, you have to stay to the end to get your CEUs. Yes. Um, uh, one second before you jump in, Marlo. And that no, is absolutely. To, just to really thank Nancy Smith. Um, Nancy, you've just, you were our first connection to make this panel happen and, uh, you brought us so much valuable information. I can't thank you enough. And to say appreciation to the administration for community living and the commissioner on disabilities and all of your team have just done a remarkable job. 
and Marlo with a uh, administration for children and family. So let me turn it over to you to close us out really with the information about the CEUs and the resources that we have available. Yes, thank you, Lynn. If you like to know what I look like, I am a black woman with black locks mixed with a few copper highlights. I am wearing gold hoop earrings, gold necklace, and a yellow blouse. My background is blue with the white words, Administration for Children and Families, sprinkled across the screen a few times. Uh, my name is Marlo Brooks, and I am with ACF's new Office of Family Violence Prevention and Services, OFIPS, led by brilliant director, Shondell Dawson. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. We would like to uplift today's conversation with a few resources provided on the next couple of slides to support the time we have remaining. Um, please visit www.activatingchange.org to learn more about the work to prevent and interrupt violence and victimization of people with disabilities and deaf people. For our continuing education, today's webinar is approved for 1.5 continuing education units for both the DOD Sexual Assault Advocate Certification Program and the National Advocate Credentialing Program. Each registered attendee will receive an email at the conclusion of today's webinar with instructions on how to download your certificate. Thank you for your time today. Thank you uh, for your voices. Thank you also for this conversation in the chat. And uh, Director Rosenthal, would you like to close out? So just a few last words. You can download the slides by clicking on this link and the recording will be available June 21st. Somebody was asking about that as well. Uh, Kara provided her contact information. Uh, and so if you had a any questions on her presentation, you can reach out to her directly. Uh, and there was a survey earlier on signing up for the mailing list. And there were so many great questions here and so many different kinds of uh, conversations we could be having. So we will plan a program like this in the future. Uh, and just another, just a word of thanks to Nancy Smith and for Keisha James and Cindy for all this great work that was done here today. Uh, it's much appreciated by all of us. Uh, so thank you all. So, and to all of you for attending, for staying with us, for giving love, for giving support. I saw a lot of support in the chat for each other as people were asking questions. So there was a real community that was created here today. And I just wanna appreciate all of that. And to be continued, I hope to be continued. Uh, there's the, uh, the poll that's coming up again. So we'll just leave that um, for another couple minutes and, um, and we'll close down. So thank you all so much for being here for this very important program.